Um, so today we're going to talk about the basics of rationing. Who, why, when, and how. So rationing, the limiting of specific consumer goods, um, restriction of those goods by the government, was a signature home front experience, one of the hallmarks of American wartime life. It's one of the ways that the war touched everyone. Um, not everyone had a war job, not everyone um, had someone in service, um, but everyone was subjected to these principles of rationing. So it was a real unifying experience for the country. Rationing changed over time. In the US, some items were rationed for shorter periods um, than others, and really that was due to availability. Um, Overall, it was an extremely complicated experience. One short government film described it as such. You can have a zillion bucks, but you have to be a certified public accountant to buy a can of pork and beans. So with that, we'll dive in. So why, why rationing? So you see, here you see American troops during the Battle of the Bulge, getting a simple meal in the field from rations. There were a few different reasons why rationing was put in place, but basically in order to feed 16 million American troops serving at home and abroad, to keep the supply chain flowing, the military and the government had to be able to ensure that necessary goods would be available. Um, in addition, they had to ensure that Americans across the country would have access to food and all that they needed to survive. And although this talk will focus mainly on food rationing, there were also a number of other products that were in short supply um, because of military need and that were restricted as well. Shipping space was also needed for the military, so transporting fresh food around the country was not an option. Um, this is the, the main principle. You see this poster, this propaganda poster here. Do with less so they'll have enough. Rationing gives you your fair share. Um, there were a number of products that were unavailable or in short supply because our access to them was cut off, either due to the Japanese occupation of Pacific Islands, as was the case with rubber, or due to German U-boat threat, as was the case with coffee. Rationing was also a safeguard against hoarding and price gouging. The underlying idea was that if everyone followed these rules, uh, the rules of rationing that no one would have to go without altogether. Rationing gives you your fair share and no one would have to pay an exorbitant price for some for any particular product. So this this same poster your chow would look good to me again you see that idea of sacrificing so that those in service um, will have enough. This social idea of rationing was really important um, and it was seen as a patriotic duty. By cutting back, by sacrificing personally, you were helping to fight the war. Food weaponized. So it's very clear here in this particular poster, food is a weapon, don't waste it, conserve it. And food was weaponized and kitchens, pantries around the country were seen as, were viewed as battlefronts. Rationing was to a great extent, the housewife's war. There was something called the Home Front Pledge. So here's another government poster. Keep the Home Front Pledge. Um, so you see the, um, the apron wearing um, woman holding up her right hand, swearing to pay no more than top legal prices and to accept no ration goods without giving up ration stamps. So when was this done? Um, rationing, here you see this image is um, a fairly famous image by a famous photographer, John Vachon, and this was taken in New Orleans in March 1943. There's the rationing board, um, and 
So this, this did, rationing didn't come out of the blue. It happened fairly quickly. And during World War I, Americans had um, undertaken voluntary rationing. So there were some shortages, people were asked to cut back, um, but it wasn't you know, an instituted nationwide. So a lot of people remembered what that time was like. Um, also, much of the war, uh, the been at war for quite some time. So, you know, people were expecting, um, you know, other countries were already experiencing severe restrictions and, and shortages. So initially after Pearl Harbor, there was a brief period of, of hoarding, of skyrocketing. So people expecting that, that um, you know, they're going to be cut off from certain products and they rush out to buy extra. So, um, but already in the country was preparing for this. So in August, 1941, the Office of Price Administration was established to oversee consumer rationing. After Pearl Harbor, um, they moved pretty quickly with some items. So tires were the first item to be restricted and um, sales were already just suspended, sales of new tires to consumers were suspended on December 11th until rationing could be put into effect. So it took a little while longer with food, um, but not much. Um, in January, 1942, the OPA got the okay to set price limits and to begin to ration food. Um, so discouraging hoarding, ensuring um, equity with uh, distribution with scarce commodities. So the first product um, to be rationed, first consumer good, um, food good, was sugar. And that was also um, the last item to come off of rationing. Sugar actually stayed limited until after the war, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But this was mainly due to, um, you know, to stabilize prices and, to, um, and it was due to the increased military need for these products. So sugar rationing began in May 1942. Coffee came next and in November. And for many people, that was the real unacceptable thing, going without coffee. And it was pretty restrictive, pretty severe. For every individual over the age of 15, the purchase limit was one pound for every five weeks. So it was not much coffee at all. Um, this was luckily dropped. So coffee was one product to come off rationing fairly quickly um, as supplies increased. Um, and rationing of coffee um, only lasted until July 1943. So it was really, you know, it was less than a year, November um, 1942 to July 1943. But initially that led to panic buying of coffee. Um, people would hear that there, that a store in the next town over had coffee on the shelves and they would rush out, you know, a lot of people would rush over to that one store. Um, but ways to cope with um, that shortage, like reusing coffee grinds, not ideal, but you know, you can do it. Um, stretching coffee with um, substitute um, chicory, for instance, um, but, but other products um, and substituting. So some things we'll talk about later. After, um, sugar and coffee, additional foods were added to the rationing slate, meat, cheese, fats, canned seafood, canned milk, canned vegetables, and other processed foods. So some of these foods had long shelf lives and they were easily transported. So many of them were shipped out um, for military rations, but um, also the substance of the container, the metal or the aluminum can was needed. So these, um, additional items were added to the rationing slate. So how was this all done? Um, this was really the main vehicle here of uh, rationing, the ration book. This particular one is number three, and I'll explain a little bit about that later. So as I mentioned, different products were rationed at different times, and we also use different types of rationing certificate rationing, coupon rationing, point rationing. Those were the main types of rationing. And all of this um, was centered on this particular piece, uh, a ration book, or really a series of ration books that individuals received. So the OPA, the Office of Price Administration, attempted to register every single American for a war ration book. Infants only weeks old, 
Um, this particular um, individual here was only four years old, but you know, from from infants to science, everyone um, was registered and would receive um, this book entitling you to specific products. The issuing of these books, the printing of them actually, was one of the largest printing jobs ever undertaken up to that point. In one year, in one fiscal year, the OPA used 40 million pounds of paper to create these and to create 5 billion forms and coupons. So when your message is to conserve goods, conserve goods, that's, that's a little bit misleading, but um, it takes a lot of paper to make this, uh, to make this project work. So the OPA structure was such that they had a national office and the national office oversaw regional district and finally local boards. And there were around 5,600 local boards around the country who had the most interaction with the public. And they distributed the ration books predominantly at schools. So they would set up large um, uh, lines, distributing lines at various schools around the country. So ration books, this is one very important point here. Ration books did not take the place of currency. Um, the book, this book here, and the coupons within the book enabled you um, only to hand over the money to buy a given product. So without the coupon, the purchase was off limits. You couldn't get the product. You had to give both the coupon that was in the book and the currency needed to buy a restricted item. There were still lots of items that consumers could buy without coupons, but for the restricted items, sugar, meat, et cetera, um, you needed both the coupon from your book and the money. So this made your ration book very valuable um, and you had to sign it. So um, sign it, protect it, and not lose it. Very important. So this is book number three. Um, book number one was the first one issued. That was the book for sugar, coffee, and shoes. And that was just a coupon system, a coupon rationing. You had a coupon inside and that would, you would give the coupon that would entitle you to buy one specific amount of sugar. And that was one pound of sugar per two week period. They also had some bonus stamps in the book that you could use at your discretion. War ration book two, three, and four, those were used throughout 1943. And that's when point rationing system was introduced. So there were two different types of stamps, blue and red stamps. So here you see, this is the inside of a ration book. Um, here you see the blue stamps. So, the blue stamps um, and point rationing, you know, this, this came about when everyone, um, when the other foods joined the slate. So two ration books were distributed for every um, eligible man, woman, and child, every person in the U.S. One contained the blue coupons like this book here. That was for processed goods. And the other um, contained red coupons. That, those were used for meat, fish, and dairy. So every person started with 48 blue points and 64 red points each month. So, you know, if you were shopping for a family, you would multiply that by the members of your family because each person had an individual book. Now you see this says ZYXWUVW. Um, those refer to specific periods of the month that you could use the particular coupons. Each month brought new ration stamps as the old ones expired. And each stamp had a number on it. So the number on the stamp, those are the points it was worth. And the letter refers to the period that, um, that it would be, they were valid for. So each ration product had a point that was assigned to it as well as its regular price. And um, the government set the point values of these items and they could vary over time. So maybe one week, a can of peas is worth a certain amount, um, eight points, and the next week it's worth five points, depending on supply. Really complicated. Um, the guide, so how would you know? The, the government printed um, the 
point list, the, the value of I individual items, and these were printed in the paper, in the newspaper, and then also posted in stores. So each store had to post the ration amount. Um, so it was pretty complicated. You had to keep track of not only, you know, if, when you went shopping, you had to keep track of not only how much money you had, um, but how many points individual products were worth and how many points you had. Um, and this all varied week by week. So it was a pretty complicated system. In 1944, initially, um, when you got a book like this, um, if you, if something was worth, um, you know, 10 points and you only had, um, and you had to give up 13, you had an eight and a five, you know, um, you would not get any change. That was, you know, you gave the tokens and that was what you had. So you had to round up. Um, later on, um, ration tokens were instituted and those you could essentially receive change. Um, so that, that, that was one development that happened in 1944. So this is all pretty complicated stuff. Um, the ration books themselves contain a lot of instructions. And um, some of them are, you know, that you could use your war ration stamps in any retail store in the US. So it wasn't based on where you were doing your shopping. Um, they were valid kinds of stores. They, um, war ration stamps may be used only by or for the person named and described in the war ration book. So that is a little um, uh, slippery, I guess, you know. Also, each person must see that this war ration book is kept in a safe place and properly used. Um, parents are responsible for the safekeeping and use of their children's war ration book. Um, I wonder how many kids got in pretty severe trouble for that one. Um, also, when you buy any ration product, the proper stamp must be detached in the presence of the storekeeper his employee or a person making the delivery on his behalf. If a stamp is torn out of the war ration book in any other way than indicated, it becomes void. If a stamp is partly torn or mutilated or more than one half of it remains in the book, it's valid. So again, uh, you wanna be careful with your book. If you lose your ration book um, or if it's destroyed, stolen or mutilated, the dog ate my ration book, I guess, um, you should report that fact to your local ration board. So this is where the local board comes in um, and, and you can actually, uh, you know, you would have to go and make your case to the local ration board and explain what happened and hope that they um, believe you. Also, when a person dies, um, his ration book must be returned to the local ration board in accordance with the regulations. And then if you have complaints, questions, or difficulties regarding your ration book, you consult your local ration board. So again, they come into play. Um, how do people know what to do? There are a lot of, you know, I explained all of these different scenarios. There were a lot of government publications that, that were issued posters, and even some short films, some newsreels that would play um, at the cinema um, to tell you, to try to assist consumers in, in figuring out um, how rationing worked. Also, there were plenty of food producers who put out cookbooks um, using their products. So Knox Gelatin, Kraft, Swan's Flower. So all of these companies had cookbooks during the war using um, things that you could buy, you know, in, through rationing. And these also assisted shoppers. In addition to um, the employees, so the OPA, what was the role of the OPA in this? And it, they had a lot of employees, um, but I think some 60,000 employees. But they also um, had 200,000 volunteers. So one particular type of volunteer, and this speaks to the, um, the complicated nature of rationing, one particular type of volunteer was ration explainer. So that's what you see here. This is um, actually 
a little badge. It's a ribbon that someone would have worn. This is in the museum's collection from a ration, point ration explainer in New Orleans. And so these folks would be stationed inside local grocery stores to assist shoppers in navigating the ration book water. So they actually had volunteers who would station themselves um, and try to aid people who were in the act of shopping. So you can imagine all of the tears shed in the grocery stores. <laughs> Um, did people actually um, get it? Did anyone understand this complicated um, uh, procedure? Some people did, and uh, I guess the majority of people said, claimed that they did anyway. Um, in 1943, 53% um, of men said that they understood how rationing worked. Um, the percentage of women who um, claim to understand it was slightly higher, 76% of women. And that, you know, just speaks to the number of um, women who were shopping, the greater number of women who took, who had to perform this role, had to understand it um, to feed their families. So the overarching message behind rationing was to conserve, not waste, to learn how to substitute um, things that um, were not rationed um, for things, you know, to substitute things that were rationed with, with products that were not, and to generally manage what you ate. Um, so how was it received? Kind of fast forwarded in the PowerPoint here, but. Um, how was rationing received? There was a lot of red tape. Um, Three billion ration stamps a month. So remember that, you know, 40 million pounds of paper. Um, Three billion ration stamps a month were exchanged. And those went from consumer to retailer, the wholesaler to the manufacturer, and then finally to the OPA. It was exceedingly complicated. But the fact that organizers were able to stand this up in a relatively short period of time is pretty impressive. Public opinion <clears throat> overall seemed to be behind the effort. Um, another poll taken at the time was that 89% of shoppers preferred rationing, they preferred this government oversight to just taking their chances. Um, they preferred something being a little bit of something being insured than unregulated uncertainty. So they would prefer to receive, you know, a pound of sugar for a two-week period than none um, if, you know, hoarding was, was um, rampant. There was also the feeling among the public that, you know, they were, people were doing their part in helping to win the war. Um, there was a pride in this sacrifice. Uh, among some. So there was also a little bit of shame um, or shaming, I guess, uh, that could occur. So if people were unsatisfied with the rations here, um, they knew that they were still getting much more than those in Europe. So the, the beef ration here was 10 times as much um, as that in England. There was also the concept of the clean plate club. So it's interesting how that kind of, that has, has lasted, that idea. Um, but the gospel of the clean plate, that concept stemmed from World War I. You know, the idea that there are thousands of people starving in Europe and to only take as much as you intend to eat. So rationing was only one aspect of the OPA's food initiative. Rationing relied on individuals to do certain things, um, and that was produced. Here we are at this um, Victory Garden poster. Um, individuals were expected to produce some of their own food, and they actually did step up. There were, um, you know, millions of Victory Gardens around the country in people's homes, um, in, uh, you know, businesses, factories, outside, in parking lots, you know, places where um, there had never been a garden before, people were beginning to garden and supplement the food, the nation's food supply 
with um, fresh food. And also it was um, this Victory Gardens were local efforts. So this was food that did not have to be transported somewhere else. Um, so people were encouraged to grow food and also can um, and preserve food. So, um, you know, keeping, keeping food, um, making food last longer, that was, was all part of this. Avoiding waste. Um, you wanted to make sure that you were, you did not have a product that you did not use. You, you were going to utilize every part that you had. Consumers were also expected to substitute non-ration goods for ration ones when possible. So saccharin, corn syrup for sugar, um, applesauce, margarine for butter, um, gelatin came into play. And I think my colleague, Abby Edens, will um, talk about this later this week um, on Friday um, in her series, Baking on Rations. So um, I think this will probably come up, although I'm not sure. Um, but certain non-ration foods also were dressed up and marketed to be more appealing. Um, and this is, you know, really some funny stories of the of rationing come out of this idea. Um, in 1944, the Louisiana legislature passed a law allowing muskrat to be sold under the name marsh hare. So again, would you rather eat marsh hare or muskrat? One and the same. Um, this was already being done in other other places, by the way. It wasn't just Louisiana. Um, and and then catfish is another um, fish that had another name, um, tenderloin trout. So a fancier fancier name, um, upscale catfish. But above all, the um, people were to avoid waste. So meal planning was front and center. If you only had a certain amount of food available and you couldn't easily source additional food, you had to make sure to make the best of what you had in hand. So here's a little, a little gentleman um, presenting his rationing book at the um, grocery for a can of V8. So um, he had a can of V8. Um, if you know you made sure to make the best of what you had in hand, and most people's most consumers, you know, unlike today, people didn't have um, you know a lot of room um, with refrigeration. You didn't have deep freezers in homes, and certainly not ones that were stocked, you know, with frozen prepared treasures from Costco or Sam's. Um, people were encouraged also um, to share. So it's, it's, it's kind of a mixed message when you're told that your ration book is really to be used only for yourself or the person named in the ration book. But you know, individuals, there are stories of you know, neighbors banding together and, and sharing you know, food from victory gardens, but also you know, if you knew that your neighbor was preparing for a special event, someone in your block had a birthday or in your office you know, had a birthday or a wedding coming up, then you, um, you know, could, um, contribute a little bit of your sugar ration to them. So um, to, you know, go towards baking a cake or something like that. So um, one other important part of this program is that individuals were expected to play square, to abide by the rules of rationing and not cheat. So there was, of course, a black market, particularly in the realm of meat, but also sugar. Um, but with meat, there was a little more um, wiggle room, I guess. Grocers could sell meat without ration stamp if it was going to go bad. So, you know, it was also by weight. So, um, you know, there was, a, you know, oh, the scale's off, or, you know, there, there were certain, there was a little bit of wiggle room there. Um, but there were also um, stories of uh, secret shoppers, of informers, of nosy neighbors, you know, to keep, to keep folks on the straight and narrow, plus your conscience, of course. Um, but uh, selling things on the black market um, was, black market was illegal, and these activities were prosecuted. Um, so 
it, black market activities could be punished, um, were punished um, with fines, with loss of licenses, um, even jail time. And still, 25% of the American public reported that they thought occasionally buying a little something um, on the black market was okay, was acceptable. So one way that you could stretch your rations um, legally was to eat out. So many restaurants found it hard to keep up with the supply. Actually, you think, you know, the 1940s people weren't eating out as much as today, and that's really not the case. Um, the, with rationing, the burden of rationing fell on the restaurant and not on the diner. So the restaurant, in effect, was the consumer in that, in that case. Many individuals during the war had more disposable income. Um, there were, you know, lots of jobs from the war boom. And some individuals had less time. They were working more. Um, so eating out was attractive. Um, and a lot of people did it. But some restaurants found it hard to keep up with the supply. So, you know, they rationing was was quite difficult for restaurants who were given their share of um, ration points on a on a completely different level. They were served. They surveyed one month of business in, um, and they were allotted rationing points based on that. So that's a completely separate topic, but I wanted to touch on it because it was one way that individuals could um, supplement their personal rationing, just to go out and make the, make the restaurants do it. So, but restaurants also um, put into place some wartime measures that individuals in their homes did as well, like instituting things like meatless Mondays, or meatless Mondays and Tuesdays, um, wheatless Wednesdays, or some restaurants would um, close for certain days of the week, totally. Um, so stretch their, um, their rations that way. So, so how did rationing end, right? Rationing wound down on pace with the war, really. Most restrictions ended in August 1945. Some products had already come off long, long ago, like coffee. Um, but in August 1945, most of the restrictions ended. Meat and cheese rationing ended in November 1945. Um, so those were a little bit later. And sugar lasted, um, sugar rationing, lasted until 1947 in some parts of the country. But overall, the U.S. fared pretty well. Um, in Great Britain, um, they endured some forms of rationing until the mid-50s, really, until 1954. So in the 50s, after rationing, you know, in the 50s, after the war, there was an explosion of the population, explosion of the suburbs, big houses, big cars, um, big hair, <laughs> big tables. Um, however, there was also um, the looming threat of the Cold War and preparedness, right? People wanted to be ready. So there was a little bit of stockpiling that took place. People remembered what, again, you know, people remembered what World War I was like, and there were some shortages. Um, again, after World War II, people remembered what that was like and prepared, stockpiling in their bomb shelter for um, the eventual um, event destruction. So, but many, I think, post-war generations, um, even into today, um, can identify with some of these lasting remnants of that deprivation, either you know from the Great Depression or the shortages of World War II, like individuals saving cooking fat, or you know, or really, or the Clean Plate Club. You know, those were again, um, you know, legacies. They might not be identified as such, but but they are in some instances. Um, in this time, um, times like these, you know, during the, the 
pandemic, um, Victory Gardens are once again entering the national conversation. So it's exciting to hear about people growing more food um, and contributing to the food supply in that way. Um, menu planning is certainly um, and food conservation are also extremely relevant um, as we look for ways to make do with what we have on hand and to not waste food um, because it's not so easy to, to get more. Um, once you run out. So uh, yeah, overall rationing during World War II is an experience that many people remember. Um, some, some of you at home may have ration books in your homes, in your attics, you may discover some while you're at home now, um, but it's clear that individuals did take the instructions very seriously to um, guard your ration books to keep these um, they save them even though they had no commercial value. Um, the, you know, they, they could not, they were not necessarily worth, um, worth anything um, other than the coupons during the time. The museum has so many in our collection that we're, we no longer need examples for our archives, but they really are great teaching tools. They're fun to explore um, and they're a fantastic entry point into the home front experience during the war. So I guess at this point, um, I'm happy to take questions. Uh, let's see. Do we know the percentage of people who supported rationing during World War II? So there were um, you know, lots and lots of polls taken. We know that there were you know, 25% of the public thought it was okay to um, you know, occasionally buy something on the black market. Um, but, you know, there was an overwhelming um, support for rationing. So I think there was also, you know, 89% of the public preferred rationing to, um, you know, taking their chances of not being able to get something. There was also a little bit of a fear um, after the war that um, prices would skyrocket again, you know, once things came off of rationing, once price controls had, had ceased that, um, that, that prices would go sky high. And they did, they did a little, but eventually stabilized. So um, were there any problems with counterfeiting of ration stamps during the war? Yes, there were some. Um, and, you know, particularly, again, sugar, um, but, um, you know, there were people out there, there were agents, um, you know, the OPA did employ some individuals who, um, you know, it was their job to suss it out. And it was also, you know, the, the grocer's job to enforce this to some extent. Um, so that was part of the, the overall um, uh, black market in general. Um, the, there is another question. If a signature was required to use a coupon, who could sign for a child who could not write? So, um, you saw if, um, the ration book that was, that I showed earlier, that was for a four-year-old and it was signed by the parent. So, um, so that would then be signed by by the parent, what was rationed until 1954. So rationing in England went on until 1954, but again, that was um, sugar and butter. So, you know, sugar is certainly the, the high priority um, product, but butter as well. Um, let's see some other questions here. Did the rubber and scrap metal drives contribute significant quantities of material to the war effort? Or was it more of a psychological benefit of allowing citizens to feel that they were directly contributing to the war effort? It was a mix um, of both. I mean, I guess the major um, uh, contribution in terms of metal and um, rubber is that companies that were producing things made of metal and rubber um, devoted themselves entirely to the war, war efforts. So these were products that were um, 
you know, there were many, a great number of products that were not available for regular consumers, um, household products um, like washing machines and refrigerators. Um, so, you know, things that, that the reg average consumer could not purchase. Um, and that certainly had a huge effect, but um, scrap metal drives and, um, and rubber drives, um, there is certainly, you know, footage of those being converted into products that were then being used for the military. So, so it was a mixture of both. It was certainly um, the psychological and social component of, you know, we're all in this together. And, and those were ways that um, uh, things, print ideas that unified the country um, in terms of, you know, contributing to the war effort, collecting scrap. And um, and collecting, you know, paper, um, saving waste fats. Um, it might not have, you know, been the largest um, factor in um, winning the war, but it did contribute um, physically and also psychologically. So let's see if there are some others. Um, did ration points have a worth in U.S. dollars? No, they didn't. Um, so you weren't allowed to sell your ration points. I guess they could have, I guess, on the black market. But no, it, it was the points. So you, um, you know, your book entitled you um, the points that you needed to purchase the item. So in and of themselves, they had no dollar value. Um, it was the license to buy um, the products. Were there any food products you could never get? There were certainly things, I mean, this comes up with, um, with restaurants a lot. Um, there were lots of products, you know, just because you go out to eat and um, you know, like seafood, for instance. Seafood was not rationed. And here in Louisiana, we eat a lot of seafood. So you would think, and it's plentiful, um, you would think that that would be, you would be able to go into any restaurant, it would be no problem to get seafood because it's not rationed. Um, well, actually, there was a need for seafood, um, for canned seafood. So a lot of the seafood that was um, fished or farmed, um, went in went to canneries so it didn't make its way to the restaurant so just because it wasn't rationed didn't mean that it was um going to be available also um some of you know some interesting things um and and some things became available at one point and then weren't available at other points but um uh poultry so you know, before um, Thanksgiving 1944, there was a huge push and a promise to, um, for every American soldier serving anywhere um, to have a turkey dinner. So, you know, what that meant that turkey was gonna be rationed um, to the American public. So meat actually came, some meat came off of rationing, but then went back on due to, you know, wanting to conserve supplies. So it really, you know, changed. Um, over time. Did people ever trade their stamps with other individuals? Now, and, and this is a good, very good question. For example, if someone didn't drink coffee, would they possibly trade those stamps for something that they needed? Um, I think officially this was discouraged, um, but in practicality, that seems like a perfectly normal thing to do. Um, you, uh, you know, it just because your your 15 year old would be entitled to um, one pound of coffee for every five weeks, along with you and um, the rest of your family, but does your 15 year old drink coffee? Maybe not, you know? So I think, you know, it all went into that big equation of the household. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm sure that happened, although, you know, officially, you know, you weren't going to do it in the grocery store in front of your grocer. Um, and, you know, you would perhaps have to make the purchase yourself and then trade the product. So it, it might not have happened on the stamp level because you were supposed to transact 
the stamp, you know, where you're supposed to exchange it directly with um, in the store. So I'm sure that, you know, trading and sharing and um, bartering did happen, um, but probably, you know, on a, a more personal level. Um, was toilet paper rationed during World War II? <laughs> um, I don't think we had the same fixation on toilet paper, but I don't know. <laughs> um, so, you know, their paper was in short supply, um, and, um, but not officially, no, not through the rationing program, not by the OPA. Um, and, um, so soldiers were on, they were, fed through a different program. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly how that worked, um, but it didn't fall under the civilian rationing program. So, all right, well, thank you all. Um, thanks for joining me. I want, I do want to say also, um, you know, we have a lot of resources on rationing on the museum's website. So check out some of our online resources as well as um, my colleagues' presentations later on this week on um, Thursday and on Friday. So um, very important, remember, wasting food is like throwing victory in the garbage can. Thanks very much.